In the beginning was matter, which begat the amoeba, which begat the worm, which begat the fish, which begat the amphibian, which begat the reptile, which begat the lemur, which begat the monkey, which begat man who then imagined God. This is the genealogy of man. That's a quotation taken from a small but a very powerful book authored in the year 1929. The author of the book was Mr. Charles Smith, who was serving at the time as the founder and the first president of the American Association for the Advancement of Atheism. His book was entitled Godless Evolution. In his lectures given during his lifetime and through the works that people would read long after he had shuffled off the moral, mortal coil, Mr. Smith wanted everybody to know one important point. There is no God. Everything that you are, everything you see around you, everything with which you come in contact, everything you hope to be, is the result of a long, blind, random, accidental, non-purposive chance process called organic evolution. To use the words of the late eminent evolutionist of Harvard University, Dr. George Gaynard Simpson, you are an accident in a universe that did not have you in mind in the first place. My friends, there is no denying the fact that this scenario in one form or another, has become the prevalent viewpoint in many quarters today, not only in our society, but in the world at large as well. I think it would be safe for me to say today that many of my colleagues within the scientific arena, in fact, most of them, would, when asked, opt for the theory of organic evolution, and many of them would eschew the word theory, and instead replace it with the word fact. But long before Mr. Charles Smith ever set foot upon this planet, there was another man who preceded him who began a statement with the same first few words and yet who drew exactly the opposite conclusion. In the beginning, he said, God created the heavens and the earth. His name was Moses. His book was Genesis written some 1,500 years before the birth of our Lord. The question becomes in our day and age, who's right? Is organic evolution actually the answer to the question of how we got here? When someone is asked, whence have you come? Which answer should they prefer? I'm here as the result of this long, blind, chance, accidental, non purposive force occurring over eons of time in nature. Or I'm here as the result of having been specially created according to a master plan by a divine creator. My friends, I suggest to you today, in all seriousness, that the answer one chooses will affect the way one lives, and rightly so. Did you ever ask yourself this question? Why is it so many intelligent people in our day and age choose organic evolution as the answer to that question? I'd like to suggest to you by way of a preface to the things that I'm about to say two or three reasons as to why so many people, so many intelligent people, so many spokespersons for important groups around the world opt for the theory of evolution. First, I would like to suggest to you this reason, and I would like to take credit for this because I think the answer is brilliant, but I need to give credit where credit is due. In his book in 1963, The Twilight of Evolution, renowned creationist Henry Morris made this observation. He said, the main reason most educated people believe in evolution is because they have been taught that most educated people believe in evolution. And if you'll stop and think about that just a minute, I believe that's true. It's peer pressure. And my friends, if you think that peer pressure evaporates once you've got that high school diploma and you're out of high school, you've got another thing coming. 
in the scientific community, the peer pressure to toe the line, to not upset the apple cart, to go with the status quo is extremely intense. And hour by hour, day by day, it is unrelenting. Imagine yourself in the place of two college students, for example. They've just left their Biology 101 class. They've gone over to the student union building. They're sitting in the basement having a soft drink together. Joe says to Harry, Harry, do you believe in evolution? All the smart folks do. <laughs> what is Harry going to say? No, I don't believe in evolution. Color me dumb. Friends, Harry may not have any earthly idea what evolution's all about. He may not know the definition of it. He may, know not, may not know the implications of it. But one thing he knows, all the smart folks believe in it. And Harry knows he's smart. So by conclusion, he's going to be among the group that believes in evolution. We chuckle at that. But my friends, I'm here to tell you it's one of the main reasons so many people among us believe in evolution. Number two, I would like to suggest to you that people believe in evolution because the important people in the world have pronounced it so. This isn't just a peer pressure. This is a person who's looking out to see before he makes a decision, what does everybody else believe? What do the authorities in the field say? And don't poo-poo this, I'll tell you why. Friends, when so, so many people from science have spoken with such eloquence and with such frequency regarding this, it becomes very impressive, especially to a youngster. When you see people, the eminence of Dr. Stephen Jay Gould, Dr. Carl Sagan, Dr. Isaac Asimov, Dr. Robert Jastrow, Dr. Richard Dawkins, Sir Fred Hoyle. When you see people like that who are literally at the top of the heap, they have doctor's degrees behind their names and awards that fill their walls. They have literally written the books. And when someone asks them, what do you believe? Without a moment's hesitancy, they say, I believe very firmly that organic evolution is a fact, period. What kind of effect do you think that has on a kid sitting under their tutelage? It can be a very powerful argument. Science has done so many incredible things. Why organ transplants are routine today. Our space shuttles ply the heavens every day practically. We've created microwaves that can give you a baked potato in seven minutes. We've put men on the moon. We have wiped out smallpox worldwide. So when one of those men in those crisp white laboratory coats walks out of the ivoried halls of academia and the research library and the laboratory and pronounces to these youngsters, there is no God. What kind of impact do you think it has? Thirdly, I suggest to you that there are people today who believe in evolution because they have made up their minds on a priori grounds, they are not going to believe in God. You mark it down, my friends. The world is filled with these people. If you make up your mind for whatever reason or for no reason at all, that you're not going to believe in God, you have no choice remaining. Evolution is your only option. As rotten a theory as it may be, as set against the available scientific evidence as it may be, as crummy as it may be in regard to its implications, you have no choice. If you've made up your mind, I'm not going to believe in God, you're stuck with it for life. A number of years ago, the renowned evolutionist Isaac Asimov, PhD in biochemistry from Johns Hopkins, the most prolific science and science fiction writer ever to have lived. Dr. Asimov, before he died, had authored over 500 books. Books, countless thousands and thousands of articles. Dr. Asimov, serving as the president of the American Humanist Association at the time of his demise, was asked shortly before that demise, why do you believe in evolution? Can you prove there's no God? Dr. Asimov was smart enough to know you can't prove a universal negative. He didn't fall into that trap. He simply looked the interviewer in the face and said, in essence, this, 
I don't believe in God because I don't want to believe in God and I'm not going to waste my time on it. Friends, he didn't believe in evolution because of the evidence. He believed in evolution because he had opted out of belief in God. When you do that, as Dr. Asimov was quick to tell, you don't have any choice. You've got to explain your origin. You're here. How did you get here? If it wasn't by that master plan at the hand of a divine creator, it had to come by accident, through random processes, naturally, over eons of time. What is this evolution we're talking about? Let me tell you what it's not. If someone walks up to you and says, do you believe in evolution? Your very first question back to them should be, what evolution are you discussing? There are two theories. One of them we call the special theory of evolution, a name given by Dr. George Kirkhut of Great Britain in 1960 in his book, The Implications of Evolution. This is the evolution everybody believes in. Creationists accept it. Evolutionists accept it. It simply says this, things do change. Friends, all of us acknowledge that change takes place. Years ago, we didn't have Charlotte cattle. But we do today. Years ago, those of us who work in veterinary medicine didn't have to worry about some lady bouncing into our clinic one afternoon with a peekapoo dog stuck up under her arm. There was no such thing as a peekapoo dog. But there is today. And years ago, you gentlemen sitting in the auditorium who have a wife or sweetheart, you couldn't rush down to the florist the day before Valentine's Day in an utter panic and order up one of any of over 1,300 varieties of roses. But today you can. Why? Why are all those things true today when they didn't used to be? One answer. Been a lot of evolution going on. But it's not organic evolution. It's the special theory of evolution that says things change, but always within certain prescribed limits. How did we get Charley cattle? We used our knowledge of genetics and crossbreeding to give you the Charley group. How did we get 1,300 varieties of roses? The same way. How did we get a cockapoo, a peekapoo? Folks, we can breed a cocker spaniel with a poodle and get you a cockapoo. We can breed a pekingese with a poodle and get you a peekapoo. We can get you lots of poos. But the simple fact of the matter is, the peekapoo is still a dog, the charley is still very much a, group, a member of the cattle group, and we all know, do we not, that a rose, by any other name, is still a rose. Do we believe in a form of evolution? Absolutely, and properly so, proud of it. But friends, organic evolution teaches far beyond that. Organic evolution teaches that one kind of animal gave rise to another kind of animal, one kind of plant gave rise to another kind of plant, and that ultimately, of course, we as humans are the end result of that long, meandering, blind evolutionary process. That we have come from some ape-like progenitor in the forests of Africa roughly three to three and a half million years ago, and that that progenitor owes its ultimate origin to some common ancestor roughly a quarter of a million years ago, and so on and so on. That kind of evolution we plainly deny and stand against. This morning, the topic assigned to me is the darkness of evolution. And I think that's an appropriate title for this reason. You and I both are willing to admit, even the atheist is willing to admit, actions have consequences. But ladies and gentlemen, no less true is the statement that beliefs have implications. If, in fact, we are going to be told that evolution is the way we got here. My first question to my atheistic evolutionist colleague is this. What is the bottom line of your view? I want to know what are the implications of your belief? If I act on it, what will be the consequences? Don't take my word for it. Listen, if you will, to Dr. Richard Dawkins of Great Britain. Dr. Dawkins is a militant evolutionist. He admits he has a, quote, fair degree of hostility toward religion, end quote. In fact, he's called religion a virus that should be wiped out. In his book, The Selfish Gene, 
Dr. Dawkins made this observation. He said, quote, you are for nothing. You are here to propagate your selfish genes. There is no higher purpose in life, end quote. That's pretty simple, isn't it? But Dr. Dawkins wanted the reader to understand the implications behind that. So listen to what he said, and I quote, I am not advocating a morality based upon evolution. I'm saying how things evolved. I'm not saying how we humans morally ought to behave. Because my own feeling is that a human society based simply on the genes law of universal ruthless selfishness would be a very nasty society in which to live. But unfortunately, however much we may deplore something, it does not stop it being true. End quote. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Dawkins is blunt to a fault. You read his books, you have no trouble understanding where he's standing. You read his works, you don't have any trouble getting through to his point. You hear him lecture, there's no obfuscation. He knows exactly what he's saying and he wants you to know exactly what he's saying. And what he's saying is this, welcome to the society that evolution has created. You want any morals? Forget it. Not in this society. This society is going to be because we are the end result of this long chain process. We are, to use the colorful expression of the zoologist and evolutionist Desmond Morris, the naked ape. We are going to be living in a society that's a very nasty place to be. Want to change it? Forget it. It's in your genes. It's the nature of things. Get used to it. So what should I expect to get used to? Well, let's talk about for just a moment evolution and ethics. You want an ethical society? Not under evolution. What is ethics? Ethics generally is viewed as the system or code by which attitudes and actions are determined to be either right or wrong. That's what ethics is all about. Some of you will remember that in 1880, when the Russian novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky published his book, The Brothers Karamazov, he had one of those characters in that book make this stinging observation. If there is no God, everything is permitted. Ladies and gentlemen, that may have been from a fiction novel, but it carries a walloping amount of truth to it. French existential philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre put it like this. Everything is indeed permitted if God does not exist and man is in consequence forlorn. For he cannot find anything to depend upon either within or outside himself. Nor on the other hand, if God does not exist, are we provided with any values or commands that would legitimize our behavior. Where will the evolutionist go, Dr. Dawkins, to get some ethics? If I wanted to do business with you, sir, if you owned a piece of land and I wanted to purchase it from you and I wanted assurances that I wasn't going to be cheated or swindled, how would you give me those? In a very nasty society? A horrible place to live? Don't count on it. Russian, uh, British uh, philosopher Russ, Bertrand Russell once made this comment. We feel that the man who brings widespread happiness at the expense of misery to himself is a better man than the man who brings unhappiness to others and happiness to himself. But I do not know of any rational ground for this view, or perhaps for the somewhat more rational view that whatever the majority desires is preferable to what the minority desires. These are truly ethical problems. But I do not know of any way in which they can be solved except by politics or war. All that I can say to find on the subject is that an ethical axiom can be defended, uh, that an, an ethical opinion can be defended as an ex, by an ethical axiom, but if the axiom is not accepted, there is no way of reaching a rational conclusion. <laughs> Dr. Russell, tell me something. 
why should I not cheat you in my business dealings with you? That brings me pleasure, makes me happy and rich. Why should I not cheat you? Well, he says, now we need an ethical axiom to keep you from cheating me. Oh, I give up. Where will you get it? Are you just going to make one up? And if you do, why should I be bound by what you make up? I don't like you. No offense intended, of course. Friends, do you see the problem we're up against? If there is no God, everything is in fact permitted. Sartre was right. Dostoevsky was right. Russell is right. The implications of the belief of evolution are horrendous. If there is no God, it's a might makes right, strong subjugates the weak society in which we live. It is a very nasty place. What was it? The phrase that Darwin became so famous for? The phrase he borrowed from his English philosopher friend Herbert Spencer? The catchphrase to describe all of evolution? It is the survival of the fittest. It is not the survival of the one who has ethics. It's not the one of the survival of the one who's got morality. It's the survival of he who is the strongest, the weak, the, the, the strongest, the most intelligent, the fastest, the, the best of the group. So if you can cheat your neighbor and be best, evolution says go for it. If you can swindle your partner and get away with it because it makes you richer, makes you happier, do it. After all, it's a very nasty society. Isn't it, Dr. Dawkins? What about evolution and morality? Morality is defined as the character of being in accord with principles or standards of right conduct. That's interesting because evolutionist George Gatard Simpson of Harvard that I quoted earlier made this observation. Listen to him. He said, man is the result of a purposeless and materialistic process that did not have him in mind. But Dr. Simpson said, and I quote, good and evil, right and wrong, concepts irrelevant in nature except from the human viewpoint become real and pressing features of the whole cosmos as viewed morally because, now watch this, morals arise only in man, end quote. Go figure. Here we've come from this long line of all these animals, and suddenly, magically, we at the zenith of the evolutionary ladder have somehow developed morals when nobody else had them. Dr. Simpson, what does this mean? Explain this to us. Dr. Simpson was known affectionately during his lifetime as Mr. Evolution. He had written more, spoken more, taught more in evolution than any man alive. He was the one who referred to church services as tiny superstitious services occurring in hamlets all over the country every Sunday morning. He felt, as Dawkins did, that religion was a virus, something to be ignored and wiped out. So, Dr. Simpson, what does all this mean? Listen to him. And I quote, Discovery that the universe, apart from man or before his coming, lacks and lacked any purpose or plan has the inevitable corollary that the workings of the universe cannot provide any automatic, universal, eternal, or absolute ethical criteria of right and wrong." End quote. You looking for some criteria to make this not a nasty society? Sorry, you're on a futile search. There's nothing out there in the cosmos that can tell you why you ought to have any right or wrong. In fact, Richard Leakey, the renowned paleontologist of Kenya in Africa, made this statement. Listen. He said, quote, There is now a critical need for a deep awareness that no matter how special we are as an animal, we are still a part of the greater balance of nature. End quote. Did you get that? No matter how special we are as an animal. What did Darwin have to say in that regard? He was the authority. Darwin said, quote, there is no fundamental difference between man and the higher animals in their mental faculties, end quote. No fundamental difference. We're still a, an animal. Where do we get morality? Nothing can explain it. Tell me something. Does a lion on an African savanna that's just gobbled down a gazelle's infant in offspring feel any remorse? 
Does a dog spend the afternoon pining away because it stole a bone from one of its peers? No. Friends, why do we feel bad? Why does even an atheist feel bad when he does something wrong? Why do we put even atheists in prison when they kill somebody? Why did even Adolf Hitler and all of his cronies fall under worldwide condemnation? They obeyed the laws of Germany, didn't they? They were fine, upstanding, moral people who were law-abiding citizens. They just went out and slaughtered six million Jews. They were doing what was right, following the law of the land. And today, some of them still rot in prisons because of the Nuremberg trials. Why? Didn't that prosecutor from our, state, from our United States Supreme Court, Mr. Jackson, have it right when he said at that trial that there is a law that transcends the geographical? Didn't he have it right when he said there is a higher law? What is that law? Why did all those justices at Nuremberg put those men into prison for crimes against humanity? If we're just an animal, if there is no difference between our mental faculties and an ape's, ours and an earthworm's, we don't put apes and earthworms in prison. Beliefs do have implications. And the people of Germany found out that actions do have consequences. Friends, it may speak fine, it may write well for Dr. Dawkins to sit behind his fancy desk at Oxford and say, well, it's going to make a very nasty society. What kind of nasty society do you think he would believe in if his wife were raped and murdered? If his daughter were kidnapped and tortured? Do you think, who do you think would be the first to scream that a moral outrage had occurred? And when one of us went to Dr. Dawkins and said, Dr. Dawkins, shut up. You have no right to say anything regarding any moral outrage. How do you think he would feel about that? Friends, this doesn't live very well. It writes great, but to live it, it it's rotten. And in fact, if you want the proof of that, examine this. Examine the proof that comes from evolution and the value of human life, as long as we're on that topic. For example, as Maxie mentioned to you earlier, I grew up here in Texas, up in Dalhart. My dad was a veterinarian. I taught at the vet school at A&M for a number of years. There have been many occasions when my colleagues, my father, and I have had to go out to some fellow's farm or ranch. He's got this prized horse. The horse has stepped into a gopher hole, snapped its leg. I'm here to tell you, not the ablest practitioner of the healing arts can ever make that horse right. Can't be done. We've had to walk to the pickup truck reach into the glove compartment, pull out that 22 pistol, walk over, shoot the thing in the head, watch it drop, take it off to the glue factory. I've been to farms and ranches and homes where I've seen a prize 4-H gelding that some little girl loved dearly almost as a part of the family. We had to take her into the house, shoot the horse in the head, and haul him off to the dump, her bawling the whole while. But she gets over it. As prized a possession as that horse may have been, it's not her brother, it's not her sister, it's not her mother or father. That's why they shoot horses. But if Charles Darwin is right, if Richard Leakey is right, if we are no different than any other animal, the slug on the ground and the human standing in the pulpit are for all practical purposes one and the same, you tell me then, what protects you any more than that horse? Why, our Supreme Court says absolutely nothing. January the 22nd, 1973, isn't that what they said? That tiny embryo growing in that womb, it's not anything. It has no rights. It's not alive. 
you can rip it out, slaughter it, throw it in the local dumpster behind the abortion clinic, and go your merry way. We'll pay for it by your taxes. We'll make it legal by your laws. You shoot a ball eagle in this country, and we will throw you in prison and throw away the key forever. We'll stop a multi-billion dollar dam in the state of Tennessee for an inch-long snail darter fish. We'll send the newly elected president of the United States on a multi-million dollar Air Force One 747 jumbo jet to the northwest sector of this country to sit around a conference table to discuss the fate of a spotted owl. But lift a hand to protect the innocent, the child growing in the womb, not us. We've become too calloused with cars, careers, cash, and condos to care. Look at the toll it's taking on us. The Centers for Disease Control last year announced that we are slaughtering almost two million of those children every single year. And I am here to tell you that is the tip of the proverbial iceberg. The CDC represent, re, suggests that that number represents only half of the numbers actually being reported. Thus, we would be slaughtering in this country over four million children every year by abortion. Their tiny souls and bodies cry out to us from those trash cans and garbage heaps the world over because the world sat silently by and believed there was no God and that evolution was true and that they were nothing more than an animal. The abortionist retorts, well, they're not alive. Well, if they're not alive, leave them alone. Oh, you can't do that. Why? Because at the end of nine months, you get a... A what? A human child. April 22nd, 1990, issue of Parade Magazine. Carl Sagan, astronomer, Cornell University. His picture was on the front cover. His wife and he had authored an article. In that article in the Parade Magazine, you know what the position was they took regarding the tiny little creature growing in the womb? Listen to them. Dr. Sagan and his wife said, this particular animal is, quote, filled with gill arches like a fish or amphibian. It has reptilian features. It will eventually give rise to mammalian pig-like features. And even at the end of two months, it resembles a primate, but it's still not quite human. So they said, and that being the case, you want to rip it out, slaughter it, throw it in the dumpster, be our guest. You haven't done anything wrong. When the lecture's over, come up to me and see the tiny little feet standing on my lapel. The international right to life symbol. Every coat I've got has a pair of them on it. It's the actual size of a fetus's feet at 10 weeks old. You look at them and tell me, it's not quite human. You hear the scream during a DSC abortion. You look at the body parts that come out that are thrown in the plastic bag before it makes its way to the dumpster and tell me it's not quite human. Now let me see if I've got this right. Because I have ruled out God, because I'm willing to live in a very nasty society where nobody can issue any edicts that have any morality or ethics standing behind them, I can get rid of the unwanted old without any peril on my part. So you tell me, who do you think will be next? Now that we've gotten rid of all the unwanted young, who are we going to get rid of next? How about the unwanted old? How about those whose hair is white with the snow of many winters, who have to come in on crutches or a walker or perish the thought, be brought in a wheelchair? You know what Darwin said about that? Listen to him. And then remember what his modern-day apostles are saying. Darwin said, quote, With savages, the weak in body and mind are eliminated and those that survive commonly exhibit a vigorous state of health. But we civilized men, on the other hand, we do our utmost to check the process of elimination. We build asylums for the imbecile, the maimed, and the sick. We institute poor laws. And our medical men, why, they exert their utmost skill to save the life of everyone to the last moment. 
There is reason to believe that vaccination has preserved thousands who from a weak constitution would formerly have succumbed to smallpox. Thus, the weak members of civilized society propagate their kind. No one who has attended to the breeding of domestic animals will doubt that this must be highly injurious to the race of men. It is surprising how soon a want of care or care wrongly directed leads to the degeneration of the race. But excepting in the case of man himself, hardly anyone is so ignorant as to allow his worst animals to breed." End quote. You have muscular dystrophy, multiple sclerosis. You have anybody in your past history with a Down syndrome child? We're not going to let you breed. You're not fit. We're going to weed you out. And should you somehow breed and you produce an offspring that's maimed, lame, diseased, cannot walk, cannot see, cannot hear, we'll weed them out as well. If we miss them when they're in the womb, don't worry. We'll catch them somewhere along the way. Friends, that is the society that we are creating for ourselves to live in when we sit quietly by and allow the world to go on thinking there is no God. Are you aware of the fact that two of the states in the United States, Florida and Oregon, have already attempted to pass legislation allowing euthanasia? Mercy killing. You know, poor old Uncle Charlie. He can't feed himself anymore. His hands shake when he tries. He's got Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease, and he's stuck over in the convalescent home or hospital. I think that we should just put Uncle Charlie out of his misery. Let's just pay the doctor and get him to give old Uncle Charlie a shot and put him out of his misery. You know what Uncle Charlie calls it? Premeditated, cold-blooded murder. And friends, if you think that it's going to stop there, you'd better think again. There have been Nobel laureates among us who have suggested in print, in their speeches, they are unashamed of it. If you have a child with a level of an IQ less than a certain amount that they have determined to make it human, it, and I'm quoting, gives up the right to live. So now we've wasted away those that were in the womb. We're going to get rid of those that are out of the womb, but they're very old and they can't take care of themselves anymore. And now we've got children growing up among us, but they don't possess the IQ that we think is the cutoff line. We'll just get rid of those two quietly behind your, behind your back. And when those of us who are Christians who are unashamed to say so, to defend the ethics and morality of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Step forth to say enough is enough. Just leave it. Just leave it, they say to us, we'll take care of it. We say, no thank you. We will not maintain our silence. We will not sit quietly by and allow you to turn our United States into another Nazi Germany. We don't need eugenics. We don't need euthanasia. We don't need mercy killing. We don't need abortion on demand. What we need is a fear of the living God. What was it Moses said in Exodus chapter 23 and verse 2? Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Brethren, it may look right. It may sound right. There may be smart and intelligent people, as this world sees them, who can with flowery words and flowing adjectives, with sentences that flow like honey and are as smooth as silk, seem to make everything be all right. I say to them the same thing that Lucy said to Charlie Brown in the character of the cartoons. She said, Charlie Brown, you're not right, you just sound right. Friends, that's exactly what's going on here. You get Stephen Jay Gould on the morning television show as he was this past Sunday. And he says, I don't believe in God because God, he's malevolent. If he exists, he's a jokester, he's a prankster. Nothing in, order, nothing in nature makes any order. 
It doesn't make any sense. I have chosen to believe he doesn't exist. Dr. Gould is a free society. You're free to believe that if you wish. But one of these days, every knee shall bow. Brethren, on that occasion, I can't speak for you, but I know exactly which side of that throne I wish to stand on. They will not shut our mouths. They will not silence our pens until the day the Spirit flees this body and it falls back to the dust of the God who gave it. I ask you this morning to join in this battle. The stakes are high. The cost terrible. But the battle worth fighting. Someday our children and our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, will take the places that we have vacated. It's up to you and to me to make certain that they know we do not want them to live in a very nasty society.